So I want to start with just thinking about um, robots that have made it into the home successfully. And uh, the first example, um, this is actually a quote from a, a gentleman that I wrote but that I just love. He said, you know, the, the path that the Roomba made into the home was because of its relationship with dirt, you know. Um, and so if you think about that analogy, you know, of course, uh, the Nest learning thermostat uh, recently was bought by Google for billions of dollars. You know, it came into the home because of its relationship with air and apps. Now, when we think about personal robots, I mean, what, what about this path, right? What about the path into the home is because of the relationship of these robots with the people who actually live there? Um, and how can you design robots that actually do that successfully? Now, you may think, well, you know, there have been these sort of expressive social robots coming into the home. Um, they've been for entertainment, for play. But, but robots need to be useful. They need to have utility. They need to provide real meaningful value beyond just having fun. And, and I will agree with you. I do think they need to have both. And so I want to present a case to you for how social robotics in particular can give you both, and give you both utility as well as uh, emotional uh, resonance. Um, in areas of our lives that have profound significance. So, um, so I started this, 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 this work uh, a long time ago. This is Kismet. If you go to the MIT Museum, you'll actually see Kismet there. I've been told now there are Kismet earrings, for those of you who are interested in Kismet earrings. <laughs> but um, this was really saying, almost like for uh, computers, it was a time when computers were very expensive, elaborate technologies that only experts knew how to use. And then one day we started really thinking about, well, what would it mean for these to come into the home and where anyone can use them, anyone who's not an expert uh, in computers. So when I started this work with Kismet, I would say robotics was very much at a similar place. We had service robots. We had people designing very specialized robots for professionals. But no one was really seriously deeply going after this question of what would it mean to bring this technology into the living room, into the home, where people who are not experts with robots from children to seniors and so forth, could actually live with these kinds of technologies and have them play a role in their daily life. What we had discovered is, you know, unlike sort of the boxes that sit on our desks and the bricks that are in our pockets today, robots, because they sense and they move and they articulate, they just push our social psychological buttons in a very profound way. So people intuitively, cognitively, want to try to understand social robots in these anthropomorphic terms, more as someones and not something. So the question then is how do you design to support that, to really be that sort of cognitive, social, affective fit with how the mind is really trying to make, make sense of them. So when we think about AI, um, it's a different kind of AI that uh, is done in a lot of other aspects of, of robotics and then it's really trying to cross over into the social and emotional dimension. So what does it mean to build a technology that's actually socially intelligent, emotionally intelligent, that can really relate to people and interact with people as people. Um, so that's really been a theme of, of the work in my lab, and as this field has grown and expanded across the world, it's become an important research theme um, in research labs all over the world. So when we think about kind of four pillars of that, you can imagine when you talk about the perceptual aspects of these machines, they're trying to perceive things that have, you know, the sort of interpersonal dimension. So social cues, nonverbal cues, not just what people say, but how they express with their body, with their faces. Many of these are subconscious. Many of these form the basis for our, our social judgments of how credible are you? Can I trust you? Are you an ally to me? So how can a robot sense these sort of cues and make sense of them and respond to them in a way that can build affiliation and trust, appropriate trust with a person? When you think about the learning aspects, this is not about sort of, you know, behind the scenes, uh, scenes crunching through big data um, sort of learning. This is really about how do you design robots that really interact with people um, much more like a collaborator, like a teacher, learner, trainer, you know, trainee sort of relationship. What we've been finding is this is, it's a fun, just profoundly collaborative process when you think about it. It's not so much as feeding input data sets into a machine and having it learn. You really need to create up this whole dynamic of the teacher trying to shape the exploration and behavior of the learner, and the learner helping to communicate and have that learning state be transparent to us and improve so that we can be better teachers. Or on the flip side, you can imagine playing that game where now the robot could be the teacher or tutor of someone else, right? So it's really about this collaborative aspect, which is, again, just kind of a different take on how we think about a lot of learning systems today. 
When we think about how you make that whole interaction work, the expressive capabilities of these robots are very important. And again, people consciously and subconsciously read and respond to these cues. I'm going to be talking a little about these in examples later in the talk, but people of all ages, even very young children, even when these cues are highly abstracted or simplified compared to what people do, we are responding to them. Our brain is interpreting and responding to them as if it's coming from like another person. So how the robot reveals its internal states to you in a way that not only helps you understand what's going internally inside the robot, but helps making that robot more predictable and understandable to you um, is a critical design question. And then finally, you really get down to the intelligence of the machine, right? So how do you build robots that can leverage what you know about human social psychology from behavior change literature, from domains of of human-human interaction, applying that to practice, to develop algorithms um, and abilities to engage people in much more of this interpersonal dimension. So this is really about, again, the, the social intelligence, the emotional intelligence of a machine. So as this field has been maturing and growing, this new um, sort of thus has been coming, coming to the foreground, which is, what if it is these social properties, their ability of this kind of technology to engage people in the social and emotional interpersonal way is the core competence from which many, many, many applications and use cases can arise. So the term right now you hear a lot about is socially assistive robots. So how do you design robots now that can really leverage, again, these interpersonal qualities to assist people more like partners rather than tools that can not only help provide you with information but can coach can motivate, can provide social support, many in the same ways that we do for, for each other. So um, as we look at, at, as this field has been growing, this, this premise has, has gone into many, many di different domains, um, again, around the world. So even within, say, manufacturing, um, we think robotics has actually put a face on Baxter so that the robot, as opposed to being roped off and doing manufacturing by itself, can actually work side by side with a human being in a way that's very tra trainable and in a way that's relatable to that person. If this robot is a teammate for me, that collaborative dynamic needs to work and those social cues play an important role in helping the person collaborate and make sense of the robot's behavior. We're starting to see robots being applied to elder care, leveraging companion animal therapy in the form of robots. Um, this robot parrot has been shown to be useful for patients with dementia and relieving stress and anxiety. Um, we're starting to see robots being applied um, in pediatrics. I have a collaboration right now, collaboration right now at uh, Boston Children's Hospital looking at the ability of social robots to understand the emotional state of children and to help reduce stress and anxiety. And within the healthcare profession, we know that positive outcomes for patients, for children, for their families, from anywhere from repeat visits from a marketing standpoint to a throughput standpoint, you know, the longer it takes for a child to be willing to take the shot, the less, it's going, you're, the less you're going to be able to have, have that throughput, and even for the health outcomes. So these themes are very profound in a lot of these different dimensions. I'm going to highlight three of these today, and again, I just want to re reiterate the, 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 I think the disruptive technology aspect of use cases for this technology in, in many, many more domains than the three that I'm really going to quickly highlight for you um, in this presentation. Each one of these obviously can be a half an hour talk in its own right. I'm just going to kind of get to the punchline for each of these. But I've chosen three very different domains. So you can get a sense of like, you know, what's the commonality between a robot that acts as a driving assistant versus a robot that might act as a health coach versus a robot that may act as a learning companion. At the highest level, you can imagine these are situations where a robot can be interacting with a person over a long time, over repeated encounters. There's an opportunity for the robot to really learn about you, get to know you, build a relationship, and provide you with the kind of support and assistance that ultimately the, the, the bottom line is, how does it help the person do better? The, the outcomes of these, it, you know, the technological side of as we design these robots in the lab, build them, program, I mean, there's certainly a lot of computational science um, that's critical to the research, but ultimately when you think about transitioning these into society, people are going to want these systems because it actually helps, helps people live better lives. So, so, again, so many other domains beyond this where this technology is being applied, but I want to, want to touch on, on these three. So, driving behavior. So, our, our group, our research group was approached by um, Audi uh, slash Volkswagen. And, um, you know, in, in the car industry, actually, they take the emotional experience of the driver um, and their emotional resonance with the car, the brand, and the driving experience very seriously, really much more than I had appreciated 
uh, before um, we had started this collaboration. Um, at the time, of course, there was also this big safety issue where people are texting and driving and it's very, very dangerous. So given that people want access to information, people are driven to multitask, can we think about a different kind of technology that can help promote safer driving behavior but also a better driving experience, emotional experience um, of the driver to the vehicle and to the, the experience of driving. The other thing that came into this, of course, that, that a car brand was interested in is, you know, we have this great Audi car, it's the Audi brand, but once they bring that phone in, they're experiencing all of these other brands in our car, right? So how can we make sure people have the Audi experience if you're in the Audi car and not the Google experience and the Apple experience and so forth. So, so that was another sort of sub, sub theme that came up. The other one that was interesting was what would it mean for this brand to be able to be experienced beyond just being in the car, right? So this is uh, IDA. IDA stands for Effective Intelligent Driving Assistant. It's actually an app on a phone. So the idea was what if this IDA app is basically with you all the time because your phone already knows a lot about you. It has your calendar, your contact list, your preferences, I mean all these sorts of music, all, all these things. What if you got into your car, literally snapped your phone into this robot so you're not tempted to pick it up and use it, but the intelligence of the um, assistance app kind of made all of that seamless so you could really much more function on the active driving and hopefully in a much more delightful, easy way. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of the prototype um, of the IDA robot and then I want to talk to you a little bit about a study that we, we did with it. So again, what if you could just click your phone into this robot, launch the app, and there's Ida. Hello. I hope your day is going good. I will try to assist you while you drive to your next destination. So again, it knows your calendar. It can access MapQuest, navigation yes. apps. Has you have left. estimated arrival time is 6.58 p.m. And your next event starts at 7 p.m. So let's say you're driving and it turns out traffic is really bad, but Ida can monitor your that in the background. Time has changed due to traffic. And then it can alert you. Guess what? You're going to be late. Um, your new arrival time is 7.29 p.m. Late by half an hour. <laughs> Do you want me to text ahead for you? Because I know who your meeting's with. I know you're yes. going to be late. Instead of having you fumble with your phone to give a heads up, let me let me send you that text. Your message was sent successfully. So you just have to say yes. Ida sends that message to you. It appears on the phone. So anyway, you get the idea here, right? So it can be much more seamless, much more proactive in the car, right? So I just want to talk about a study then very, very, very quickly. Um, comparing the case of this robot, because you might ask, well, what's the difference between a robot versus the smartphone versus even just the app running on the phone static on the dash. I mean, does it matter that it's the robot? Could it just be something like a display versus even having a, a human passenger? Now, in the case of the study, this was not a friend. The people coming in for the participants didn't know this person was a stranger sort of condition. But still, having a human assistant there who helps try to promote safe driving behavior, who helps provide sociability, right? So we've compared these, these four different cases. As you can imagine, we put them all through the simulator. Um, in the first part of the study, we gave people a chance to familiarize ourselves with the simulator, with the phone, because this obviously wasn't a phone. That was their typical phone. Um, we had an opportunity to see if they would actually engage in some safe um, practices like fastening their seatbelt, checking their mirrors. And then they would actually start the driving task. So the bottom line is there's a navigation system in the car. It's like driving a car as much as we could possibly make it, giving it a simulator. And as they pass certain landmarks, these certain conditions or interventions or kind of cognitive loads happen. So we start gathering data once you pass the first landmark. There's video we're capturing once we know they're kind of familiar enough with the simulator. When they pass the second landmark, they get an incoming call. So the task is you're going to go to salsa lessons with Pedro. So Pedro calls, and he's like, dude, where are you? Where are you? You know, so he's at, again, introducing the sort of cognitive load. Now you could either take the call yourself if you are only have the phone condition, or Ida can offer to answer it for you if you have an agent condition, or you could ask the human to take the call or whatever. So you have the choice in the human condition whether you take the call or you have uh, the person next to you take the call. Later, you pass another landmark, then Pedro starts sending you text. Dude, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. And so again, you have a choice of whether you're going to respond to the text or not. At the end of the, the interaction, you, you check the mood. So again, you have these disruptions that add cognitive load, and you want to look at issues, again, of kind of effective experience of the driving as well as performance. So here's the punchline. 
interestingly, people actually drive more safely with the robot. Um, even more safely in some cases than with the human, because you can imagine for a human you have to turn and take your eyes off the road. Um, and in many cases more safely with, with the agent. So it's intriguing that something about this physical social presence in the car, actually maybe you, you try to be, I don't know, safer because you have that sort of social accountability of that. Maybe it's because it's in line with your eye of, uh, line of sight. But the bottom line is it's intriguing here that people actually drove more safely, had less sort of unsafe behaviors in terms of collisions, off-road driving, speeding, and so forth um, in all these conditions. The other thing that was interesting is um, people liked it better. The cognitive load was reduced in the, age, in the robot case. The sense of co-presence was strong, not quite as strong as the person, understandably. But sociability, actually, the robot outscored the person by, by some. So, I mean, it's intriguing, right? And in terms of the positive effect, if we look at the video in terms of how much people are smiling and so forth, way, way, way stronger for the robot. So again, this is just really, really intriguing. So when we think about the future of cars, we all know that cars are becoming more and more like robots every day. There's more autonomy, there's more computer and so forth. It's intriguing to think about the time when these social and emotional aspects are going to come into your car as well. So not only will you hopefully love your car, but maybe your car will also be emotionally bonded to you too. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So that's driving. Now, I'm going to move to a different topic here. This is sort of a disturbing image here, but um, health. So chronic disease management. Um, this basically says it's serious. It's serious in the United States. It's one of the leading causes of premature death and disability. So, so this is something that we as a country um, want to get a handle on, right? Um, so what if you could design a technology that really engaged you as a personal health coach to really help you manage chronic disease, right? There's been a lot of literature around this. We know it's incredibly costly to our healthcare system. We also know in the case of chronic disease management, social support, behavior change is really key um, to, to positive outcomes. And so when you talk about a technology that's social, that can be a coach, this is a particularly interesting domain um, for us to think about designing technologies with these properties. The other side of this equation is that there's just not enough care professionals. So can we create a technology that in between your doctor visits, which are fairly infrequent, can you have something in the home living with you, like your personal health coach, that can really help those ends meet? So we did a, um, we developed a robot. This is the work of Corey Kidd, who actually commercialized this technology, looking at weight management, because it turns out that obesity alone in itself is a huge issue in the United States, but it's also a precursor to a lot of these chronic diseases down the road. So there's a lot of innovation happening in the, air, happening in the area of technology in the intersection with weight management um, and chronic disease management. So what about a robot, right? What about a robot? So you can have a robot, you can imagine in your home, a physical manifestation of this sort of health coach. One interesting thing is, can this robot help you manage your other technological devices, like your pedometer, your Bluetooth scale, to help make the process of gathering information about how much you've eaten exercise just easier? The other thing that's intriguing about a social robot is how can it be integrated into a human support network? When we talk about social robots, we don't want them to replace the humans in your network. We want to augment and extend those networks, right? So robot is kind of this intriguing thing that can live in both networks, your social network and your technological network, right? So I'm going to show you a quick video of, of the commercialized version of Autumn because it looks a lot better than what was actually in the lab. But um, you also hear some experts from Dr. Carolyn Napovian. So we did this research in collaboration with her. She's a, one of the leading experts in weight management in, in the New England area. So Corey went off, founded a company called Intuitive Autom uh, Automata. Um, and this is, this is the robot that, that was based on Hi, the research. my name is Autumn. I'm a personal weight loss coach. I will help you lose weight and keep it off forever. Autumn makes it easy to stick with a diet. It's easy because I'm here every day for support. She didn't need a new diet. She needed my help to stick with it. Autumn is the most effective weight loss technique we've tested. Autumn kept me motivated and it's quite simple to use. Autumn combines the best of what we do in the clinic with the support of having a coach at home every day. With my daily support, I help you reach your goals and keep the weight off. <laughs> Thanks. She creates an emotional bond that helps you not only lose, but more importantly, keep off the weight. Autumn is a very effective way to stick with the diet. I'm looking forward to meeting you. See you soon. All right, so it's intriguing. So, so they kind of gave you the punchline, but the bottom line is we, we did do a study in the New England area. It was a six-week study. We actually built a number of robots. We actually deployed computers that we studied the way Dr. Apovian interacted with her patients. Um, we modeled those dialogues. There's a lot of behavioral change tactics um, that are known practices that you can imagine programming into a dialogue system. 
we had the robot or, or the computer in the case help with collecting the information about how much you exercised, how much you ate. We would have graphs to help display that. If you fell off the wagon, so to speak, the robot would help you or the computer would help you get back on. One of the interesting things about the system is it actually asked you questions every day from this instrument called the Working Alliance Inventory to measure how strong was the working alliance. And if the robot or the computer sensed that the working relationship was getting weaker, it actually would engage in dialogues, relational dialogues, to strengthen that commitment again. So it's an example of a autonomous, socially deployed, socially intelligently deployed system applied to this domain of weight management. The other sort of control was just what Dr. Apovian does now, which is you know handing out these kind of paper logs, right? So these were the three conditions: the physical robot with this AI dialogue system, a computer with the exact same AI would give you exactly the same advice, but it just wasn't a robot, and then pen and paper logging as standard of practice. So here's the punchline. People actually use the robot a lot more. So as you heard in the video, the challenge of weight management isn't losing the weight, it's actually keeping it off. People will lose weight using all kinds of crazy diets. It's keeping it off that's really hard. So this is why the long-term engagement is key. People engaged with the robot for a much longer time than the other interventions. Um, when you looked at this, again, this quality of the working alliance, did I feel like a team, did I feel like this robot understood my goals and so forth? Um, stronger for the robot than the computer, even though the dialogue was literally the same. So there's something about the physical social presence of the system that really boost, boosted this up significantly. People reported trusting the robot more than these other interventions. They were more engaged. There's other plots I can show you about more credible and so forth. The other thing that was really intriguing that you heard in that video was the emotional relationship was fundamentally different with the robot than the other interventions. People bonded with the robot in a way that you'd see them dress them, um, they would name them. Um, even when he came to pick them up, some people would come out to say goodbye to the robot. Um, so, I mean, it's intriguing. So I think part of it was because people see computers as I do my word processing on that, I do my taxes on that. Autumn was really here for me for this goal. Autumn's here to get my back on something that's really important to me, so we think that also might have had something really important to do about the weight management. So again, when we think about something like a health application, technologies of these properties are, are really intriguing. The last domain I really want to touch on briefly is, is learning, um, and particularly early childhood learning. So a lot of the research my group is doing right now is really targeting this, this application domain. So um, it's key. This is, this, is, this is a huge area ripe for innovation. You, you see innovation happening with Coursera and Udacity and, and, and these you know, kind of K through 12 up. I think there's a huge opportunity to innovate with technology for the, for the zero to five age group as well. And, and, and again, this is, this is really key for our country. So for those of you who heard the State of the Union address, President Obama explicitly called out the importance of early childhood learning. Um, basically saying it is known to be the best investment we can make in the education system, that it's key to what you learn in year zero to five is key to success in the formal education system. And the bottom line is we're just not reaching enough kids fast enough. Right, so he called that out point blank um, in the State of the Union address. When you look at the numbers, basically in the census, you know, almost 46% of kids are not enrolled in preschool. So the challenge is, when they come to kindergarten, they're not ready to learn. They're behind the other kids, and the challenge is they never really quite catch up. So they have increased rate of dropping out of school, of teenage pregnancy, of drug addiction. I mean, all kinds of things are correlated with this. So. Huge, huge, huge opportunity. There have been studies studying the, the, the importance of even when you come into kindergarten, your working vocabulary. This is a critical precursor to your ability to learn to read. If you don't have the kind of conceptual networks within your head when you come into school, reading words on a page and mapping that to all the cognitive structures, if it's not, the foundation isn't there, kids have a really hard time learning how to read. And that just puts them behind the eight ball from, from there on out. It turns out there's been studies looking at even just the number of words heard by children, zero to five, in professional settings versus working class versus low income. There's a 35 or 32 million word gap. So you can imagine that's going to have a profound impact on the vocabulary that children from these different uh, social economic classes would have coming into school. So again, huge, huge opportunity, huge challenge of national importance. There is, of course, a, a place for technology to step in. There's a lot of discussion now around, of course, young kids are very fluid with apps and, and tablets. Is it the best kind of technology, though, for children when they're this young? Right? We know that pediatricians don't recommend any screen time from the point of where a child's from zero to two years old, being in front of a TV and so forth. So you know, having this personal technology in 
kids planting their faces in. Is that, is that really the kind of technology you want for our youngest learners to have? When we know they learn in the real world, in interpersonal collaborative interactions, and in social interactions with peers and their parents, don't we want them to be more immersed in that kind of interaction? There have been studies happening um, on a global scale just showing, of course, we're not surprised, kids love robots. And when they talk about how they think about robots, they're like sidekicks. That's the social and emotional qualities that really appeal to them. They see them as systems, technologies that are like a friend that helps them be creative, that helps them learn. So kids are already mentally there. So let's start exploring it. So what if we could design robots that actually interact much more like a physically present learning companion for children? Maybe you still leverage apps. You can still leverage that as a meeting for content and games. But having that social presence, you know, what, is, what does that um, bring into the equation? So I want to just touch very quickly on two studies that we've done around this area of learning uh, vocabulary. We recently did a study, this is with David DeSteno at Northeastern University and Paul Harris at Harvard, um, looking at vocabulary learning um, in the context of unusual animals. So these are animals that are so strange, I didn't even know what they were, um, learning the names of them, comparing the case where a person, that animals are coming up on this tablet here, so that's the kind of medium for the information, but a person is sharing them with a child versus the robot doing the exact same thing that the person does in the dialogues and so forth, or the tablet speaking itself while showing these images on the tablet. So how do these compare in terms of how these young, young learners interpret or perceive and are engaged with these, these different kind of interventions? Just an example of some of the animals that were on the, the tablet. So again, they're quite unusual. Um, and a quick video to give you a sense of what this looks like when uh, a child interacts with the robot condition. Again, the other conditions, they say the exact same thing, so all of that is controlled. But here, uh, here's our little dragon right, box. This is Blue. Blue's a robot. And this is my friend Elsie. Ooh. Hi! Hi, Blue. Blue's a robot. Hi, Blue. Blue's a robot. Hi, Blue. Blue's a robot. Hi, Blue. Are you guys ready to look at some animals together? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just like earlier, we're going to see animals appear on this screen. They'll be right here on the table. So I'll let you guys look at your animals together. Let's look at the animals. So first they look at the animals, and then you'll hear a case where the robot actually names the animal. So this, again, is the, the protocol. And it was the same protocol all across all conditions. So it says, ooh, let's look at the animals. The experiment will change the next one. It says it's a weird animal. So again, the exact same protocol. And then here. Ooh, you can see those social cues, right? She's responding to the robot social cues. Do you see the bintron and so forth? So what does this look like? Well, so interestingly, children, of course, really love the robot. They really, really, really want to interact with even more than the person. They wanted to learn with the robot. So the engagement factor was very strong. So that's interesting. Now, interestingly, also when you in this task, because you know it's a very sort of look at a tablet information task, children learn pretty much equally across all the interventions. You didn't see a huge difference in the ability to re retain uh, the name of the unusual animal as well as in a pre, pre the the test at, after the intervention as well as a week after. So. No measurable difference in this particular learning class. However, you would expect that the more the social cues and interpersonal relationships affect the task, you would expect the robot to be probably more, more effective, more like a person. We did see that children definitely, um, you know, when you ask the child about um, is, 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 is the robot more like a person or the tablet, um, or who would you go to uh, if you have this novel piece of information? So they tended to want to ask the person, but interestingly here, the robot was the second most favored uh, intervention if you have an, a new thing you want to ask about. Um, and interestingly, they saw the robot as being much more like a person than an iPad when it tried to teach you something. So again, it's intriguing that children see the robot as more of a person-like thing rather than a, a tablet tool-like thing when they're learning. Very quickly, I just want to touch on another study where now we looked at two robots with different nonverbal behaviors, one where the robot responded contingently to the child, one where the other robot was as expressive but didn't respond contingently to a child. So we're varying the nature of the nonverbals here in terms of the timing of them, the responsiveness to the child, but not in terms of the overall expressivity. What we found in this case was across the engagement, across the liking, um, they learned equally well from both robots, but interestingly, when they were asked if there was a new thing, a new bit of information, who would you go to for advice? There was an overwhelming preference for the contingent robot. 
So again, when you think about the importance of these nonverbal cues as framing children's perceptions of this as a credible source of information, even very young children are reading these cues and responding to them in a really meaningful way. So again, these, 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 these qualities, I think, are really important, and they're missing in a lot of the technologies we design, we design for kids. So just to quickly wrap up then, I touched on these three areas. You know, intriguing that you can see improved human outcomes on each of these. Um, so now just some reflections, you know, so where I can get a little more opinionated and less data driven here. But the big picture here is social robots, I think, are really compelling and profoundly important because they're really a technology for human betterment. As opposed to robots that manipulate stuff and help you do things with stuff, social robots are fundamentally about people and helping people do better. And in these studies and in the studies that are happening all across the globe today, what if it's just the case that people just do better with robots? What if they just do better with robots than screens and so forth, right? That's really important. That's really significant. So kind of what's the new story about robots, right? So when we think about, again, the commercialization aspect of it, we can imagine sort of there's, there's these higher end, very sophisticated, expensive robots where it's the physical competence, the ability to navigate from point A to point B in unstructured environments, the ability to manipulate objects. That's their core competence, and you're trying to create commercialization and value around that core physical competence. But it tends to put you more in a bucket in terms of the kinds of tasks that the robot can do because it's tied to a physical competence. We have systems that have come out into homes, again, where you have, say, weak emotional engagement, but there's functional utility. They tend to be single-purpose sort of technologies, like pool cleaners, lawnmowers, and so forth. You've had this other side, which is really about the social ability and entertainment, where, again, it's almost you know, limited kind of useful utility other than the emotional entertainment value. But there's a huge opportunity here if we have a mind shift about these kinds of robots in particular to say, what if the core competence of these robots is its ability to engage people, and that the power of robots is, 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 is to enliven content and become almost a new platform for, for media. So in doing that, whether it's in all of these examples, health information or educational information or telepresence and so forth, suddenly robots can come into the home and have broad utility and strong emotional engagement across all these areas. So this is really intriguing. So maybe the path into the home is to take kind of a page from the playbook of like tablets and, and app stores where creating a platform that can have deeper personal engagement to drive customer engagement consumption of, of that content, driving more brands to want to put their content on that platform to have more multi-purpose utility is sort of this engine for sustained growth. So maybe that's how personal robots are really going to take off um, and get into the home. And I think it's going to lead to this whole next wave, right? So when you think about where tools and technologies are today, you know, we had computers, we had the internet, we have things getting mobile, social media networks, but of course this is all about technology as tool and the democratization of information. I've just told you a lot about there are these other huge dimensions of huge important need and importance where the social and emotional factors really matter. And social robotics are intriguing in that they really bring this high-touch dimension to high-tech. And with that, can they lead to the democratization of access to humanized services and support, which are so key for quality of life. So this is what I would like to see is kind of the next stage of, of robotics coming into the home. And I really do think the time is now. There's a lot of factors that are working in our favor now from, from the mobile computing revolution in terms of not only the societal cha challenges, but the affordability of sensing, of performance of speech rec, effective computing. All of these things are coming together now. Where it's actually possible to build these technologies at a mass consumer price point and actually try to get them out there into the world. So uh, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much.